the Down Talk. You're listening to World SBC 88.3 FM. Hey, Paul Pointers, what's up? We back inside the radio station. Could you believe it? It's your favorite uncle, Uncle PJ, with another PowerPoint for today. And here it is. It says, because God loves us at all times, we are always willing to reflect his love to others. You know, when you think about reflection, you think about a mirror. You know, sometimes when you look in the mirror, you see yourself. But guess what? God is saying to us that when we look in the mirror, we should see him. And guess what? We should see him shining to us. You know, the scripture says in Revelation 3 and verse 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone should hear my voice and open the door, then I will come in and will dine with him and he with me. You know, that scripture is so important and so vital to every Christian, including you, little girls and little boys. Guess what? God wants us to always reflect him. So if we say, God, come into my heart, guess what? He wants us to share that love that he gave to us with others so that they too can know that wonderful, loving God that we serve. Will you do that today? Be that reflection of Christ? I promise you, God will be pleased. So once again, it's your favorite uncle, Uncle PJ, with another PowerPoint for today. God bless you. Burn the Black Stick People were very afraid of Joseph in his village in the African country of Tanzania. People were very afraid of Joseph in many other places in Tanzania as well. In fact, People were afraid of Joseph in other countries in East Africa and even as far away as Norway. Joseph was a witch doctor. People who did not know the God of Heaven asked Joseph to heal them and their loved ones. People who did not know the God of Heaven asked Joseph to put curses on their enemies. Joseph owned a black stick that he kept in a special place in his house. He used the black stick when people asked him to heal someone. He used the black stick when people asked him to curse someone. He believed that the black stick had special power. He thought that his life was hidden in the black stick. People were afraid of Joseph's black stick. But even more than the stick, they were afraid of Joseph. They believed that he even had the power to kill by simply pointing his finger at someone. What people didn't realize was that Joseph didn't have any special power the power that they thought he had came from evil angels. Still, no one dared to say a word against Joseph. Not in Tanzania. Not in other East African countries. And not in Norway, where Joseph once traveled to practice his witchcraft. Then Seventh-day Adventists came to Joseph's village. They invited Joseph and other villagers to listen to sermons about the God of Heaven. Joseph was curious, and he went, as he listened, the power of God touched his heart. He decided to give his heart to God and be baptized. The preacher was delighted that Joseph wanted to live for the God of heaven. But he told him that he needed to burn all his wicked charms. Joseph owned many charms that he used to practice his witchcraft. The pastor said Joseph should burn his charms in front of all the village. Joseph agreed under one condition. You can burn everything but not the black stick, he said. He said his life was hidden in the black stick and he would die if the stick was destroyed. The preacher assured him that he would not die. Your life is not hidden in the power of the devil, but in the power of Jesus. You won't be harmed if you only trust the Savior. Joseph and the preacher spoke for a short time. Finally, Joseph agreed to burn all his charms, including the black stick. A big bonfire was set up in the village. Joseph tossed his charms into the flames as the villagers watched in amazement. The man who had frightened them with his witchcraft was now destroying his witchcraft in the fire. The man whom they had feared so much now feared the God of heaven. Joseph did not look like a scary witch doctor as he watched the bonfire. A big smile stretched across his face as he joyfully leaped around the flames. In an upraised hand, he held a Bible. 
watching villagers sang praises to the Lord. Joseph didn't waste any time in sharing his new love for the God of heaven. Shortly after his baptism, he introduced a friend, who also was a witch, doctor, to God. He also was baptized. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help build a new building at the University of Arusha in Tanzania so more pastors can be trained to preach the love of Jesus to which doctors and others in Africa. Thank you for planning a generous offering. Power pointers. I hope you are ready to study today's lesson today. We're at lesson five. The topic is Midnight Friend in Galilee. The power text is Proverbs 17, verse 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Point, point is because God loves us at all times, we are always willing to reflect his love to others. As we start, let us pray. Dear Lord, please be with us in this discussion. Please give us the right words so we can answer the questions and in to get the message that you want, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now let's look at our Bible lesson at a glance. Jesus teaches his disciples with a story and an illustration. The story is about a friend asking to borrow bread in the middle of the night. Jesus also refers to a parent's willingness to give good things to his child. Both examples give a picture of God's willingness and readiness to give good gifts to us. This is a lesson about community. When we help friends in need, whether it is convenient for us or not, we help spread God's love and build community. We want to be true friends at all times, regardless of the personal costs. Now I would like to introduce my fellow panelists on the program, Kezia Johnson and Nathaniel Adderley. Let's look at our first question. This lesson is about giving good gifts or the willingness to give good gifts. 
But what are some qualities of a good friend that you would want to see in your best friend? Can go, Nathaniel. One who has each of the fruit of the spirit down pat. I mean, I just want all of those in my friend. Because if you fall through the spirit, like you got a perfect friend, like right there, like you have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, self control, gentleness. That's that is what I would call the ideal friend. I know not everyone ideal, but there are some key traits that a good friend would have: love, joy, peace, patience, kind of generosity, faithfulness, self control, and gentleness. Man, this song is still stuck in my head. Hello, once again. Um, I think some good characteristics of a friend is, yes, the fruits of the spirit, but I actually think about it, and I don't know if every person, I don't know, because God wants us to have those things, but people are not perfect. I mean, I'm not going to say that, actually, because God wants to have these things, so if he wants us to have the fruits of the spirit, then we should have them. But my friend, she, uh, my best friend, she actually checks them off for me. Um, she's patient with me. She's kind with me. Um, she's loving towards me. Um, she's a good person, and she, I guess, she has self control because, and she's kind because I mean, she's never in in like times of like when we're doing schoolwork or anything. Self control, like it's hard to have in school. And I'm not gonna lie. Like, you want to focus, but you also want to do something else. I've seen her persevere as well in, like, school, and she's a strong person. So I see all of those things in her. I also think in a good friend, your friend should not be the one to entertain and to gossip. And by word of mouth, that person, your friend should not be that kind of person. And I remember a girl had come to my school way back in when I was in grade 8, and I had some friends already and she came and she was and she started to like gossip with me and I wasn't entertaining the gossip gossip but she was gossiping to me and I was like oh that could be a good friend and one of my best friends at the time uh she was really wise she said Kezia those who gossip with you will gossip about you and legit the next week that girl had my name like all over like she could not stop talking about me and it was crazy because, like, it's, like, you never know who's your friend until times of adversity. And somebody told me that, I said, when you never know who your friend is until the rubber beats the road. And my best friend at the, at the time, like, right now, the rubber has met the road. And she has been everything but disrespectful or anything like that. So I think I have a good friend and I have to keep her close. But, um, yeah, I think friends should not, friends definitely should not lie. They shouldn't um, blackmail you or treat you in a type of way where, like, you feel guilty about certain things you do. It should never feel that way. And I never think it's supposed to be one-sided. Both of the persons, both you and your friends, should work towards being the best persons you can be in that relationship. I agree with all your answers. Um, some qualities I would want to see in a good friend. I would say the fruits, I agree with the fruits of the spirit, but I don't want, the reason why I actually push on mainly is to bring out the point that qualities in a good friend is not just to say, this is my type. It's, it's, it's showing that you recognize the importance because the quality of the friend will become their character. And if their qualities are bad, character is bad. And it also shows what they stand up for as well. So that's why you're able to differentiate, you see, like, who you think would be someone good to keep around you or someone you think would be bad to keep around you. Um, next question would be, what is the lesson that you get behind the story? What is the lesson that you get from this story that Jesus told? Um, what I got from this story basically is that um, when you have a friend, your friend should be able to come to you at any time, and even if it's out of, even if it's not convenient for you, 
Um, you should be there for your friend, especially if they're always there for you. And in this story, you know, the father was like, um, he knew he could come to me because I'm his friend. And I know that if anything, without a shadow of a doubt, he knew he could go to that friend at the middle of the night. And I feel like if you think about it and you use the same story, but you put yourself and your friend in that. And if your friend comes over and they need something, to can you do the same thing and would your friend be able to help you? That actually made me wonder when I read the story. I'm like, can some of my friends um reciprocate the kind of or the level of um of care that I'm showing. And I think most of them, I think it, all of them can. And that's a question that you have to ask yourself when you have friends, because people think um, having friends or making friends is something trivial. It really isn't. That's somebody you trust and somebody you try to share your life with. So um, that's what I learned from it. I learned that um, in times of adversity, um, if it's convenient, no matter what, if it's convenient or not, your friend should be able to say, hey, Joshua, hey, Nathaniel, I need this. And you should be able to help them out and vice versa. You need their help. They should be able to help you out. What I love about this story is that you're able to relate it to real life and you're also able to relate it to a spiritual meaning. The real life situation, as Kezia said, Regardless of the circumstances, you'd be able to go to that friend. They would be able to help you or at least give you advice. Because, you know, they, they might not have all the resources at that time. See, in Jamaica, I'm not sure if they use it in the Bahamas. We use this term, brethren. Yeah, my brethren. And it's, it's a very special term. Well, for me personally, it's a special term. Knowing that you can trust somebody, you can know that they're there for you. And even if they don't have the resources, they can at least give you advice on something, you know, that can help you advance to the next step of solving your problem. Um, in terms of the spiritual meaning, this this um lesson also talks about, I can see how it can re be related to God and how when God is, when we ask it says in um, Luke 11, verse 9, which is one of the references for this lesson, um, asking it shall be given to you, seek and you shall find, knock and shall be opened unto you. First sentence is, for everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. So it also shows that how God also wants the best for us, just like how we would want the best for a friend. God wants the best for us, and he would be he would be willing to do what is necessary. Um, Nathaniel, do you have any more? Do you have any point? You can go ahead. I'll try this. I couldn't find out a reason, but then I found one. I'd like to elaborate how, how like when you get friends, uh, like when you get friends, they have to be like true, true friends, like people who would. Be with you, like people will be with you, like they would stand up for you, they have your back. Like, let's say you got in trouble, and then the other person just left without you. Like, you need like a true, true friend who will stick with you to the end. Like, you never know if it's a true friend until like a serious or something happens, which just shows them, like, oh, I was only friends with you for the money. Have you so rich? Or you I was only friends with you because of this, this, that. Like, he, like, you need true friends, like, who have the, as I said, fruit of the spirit, people who are just trustworthy. That's my point. I agree with that point, Nathaniel. Let's move on to question three. Think about a situation like the story that happened to you, and what did you do in that situation? I'll repeat. Think about a situation that is like the story that happened to you, and what did you do in that situation? Well, obviously, I was in an exact same situation. Like, 
midnight, a friend asking for bread. But um, I do know, I don't have them at a specific time, but um, most of the time when my friends need me to do something for them, it's normally, I normally say, yeah, because like, what else do I have to do? But uh, I do it. And sometimes, sometimes, just sometimes I get, an, not annoyed, but I feel like, oh, they could just like, don't do it. Like, don't ask me to do something like that. But when I take thought and think about it, um, I do it. And I'm not actually normally happy when I do stuff like that. And um, I would want them to do the same for me. So I think about that. And I'm pretty sure most times I do um, end up being convenient for them and being a shoulder for them to cry on if they need to. But not literally, but meaning if they need something, I'm normally there and they know that they can ask Kezia. And But sometimes uh, I feel like... Sometimes friends take, not friends, but people take advantage of you. And um, when you seem too open and too convenient and you're able to just, anytime they need you to do something, you're the go-to person. Sometimes, no means to go negative here, but just to be um, sure, sometimes friends, people take advantage of you and they they just take you for granted and they you are there so they use you basically essentially they use you and I feel like sometimes you have to be careful of that but um, most of the times friends just need somebody and when you're there you're there and I think for me I do normally um I, I am normally that person to be able to help them or at least give advice if I'm not able to give them something okay then Nathaniel, do you have something to say? Okay, I'm gonna give my answer. Um, I, I personally have not been used before by a friend. I personally have not been used before by a friend because my my friends at church put it to me this way: if if you're at a if you're at a party and People there are cursed and swear and all that stuff. And when you come to the party, if your presence there doesn't change their actions, that means you're not doing something, right? Because if your friends are using you, if your friends are using you, that means me personally, my friends know my limits. They know my beliefs. They know my limits. And as a friend, People using you, really, really, realistically, you have a part to play in that. I believe that you have a part to play in that. A situation that this happened to me, uh, that's a day to day thing. <laughs> that's a day to day thing for me. Um, me being, I'm not trying to brag, but me being arguably the smartest person in my class, people say that arguably. Um, there's a lot of people that come to me for advice and such forth. And I must admit, they do try to use me. Like a lot of the times they're like in this exam and say, hey, you know the answer? And it, uh, it all depends on your limits. As long as they know your limits, as long as they know your beliefs, then you'll be able to know how you're reacting the situation if it's something that is not to your beliefs, like asking for exam answers, that that wouldn't work. But if it's like asking, yo, what, yo, what's yeah, me have this assignment for you. Um, you can give me some like advice or something. Not necessarily telling them the answer, but like giving them an idea of what the question is asking for. So it all depends on your limits and beliefs in terms of these kinds of situations. I'm going to move on to the last question now. Luke 11, 10, verse 30 to 13 says, is what it says, For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask for it of any of you, that is a father. Will he 
give him a stone? For if he asks a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? What do these verses mean to you and how can you relate to them? These verses basically are talking about how if you ask for something, you'd be willing, willingly give them, give it to them as long as it's in the right deed. So what do these verses mean to you and how can you relate to them? Well, what they mean to me, like it's giving a foundation of what a good friend should be. Like, if I ever want to be like, oh, something's not right, like, I can improve on this. I go to these verses and hear them, and I'd be like, then three minutes later or ten minutes later, I'm like, that's how I fix my mistake. That's how I become a good friend. Thank you, Bible. Thank you, Jesus. Because Jesus kind of gave us instructions inside those few verses, and that's what they mean to me. Like, they're like instructions of how to be a good friend and how to be, you know, modest and Modest and you know all that kind of stuff that helps us to be you know a good person in society. Um, this verse means to me that uh, basically, I think it's mainly talking to parents to their kids, but um, that first part where knocking at the door shall be open, seeking you should find. Um, I just think that, well, to me, that means like, um, don't be hesitant to do things because you never know if somebody's going to say yes, or you never know if they're going to say no. And I find like a lot of times, um, when you actually ask, people normally say yes. Sometimes they say yes. And, um, when you look for something or, um, in general, if you just ask for something, you normally find it or you normally get what you need. So that, that's what that first part means to me. And that second part with the gifts to your children, um, I think it means to me where uh, everything should be given in was it, portion or discretion, kind of like. So if your kid is asking for like a PS5, right? And you know he doesn't focus in school, you know, he's not doing his absolute best, and you know a video game will, or a set will make him le more distracted, you have to think about that, and you have to say, hmm, is this in the best interest of my child, or is this in the best interest of the person I'm giving this gift to? And if it's not, hmm, think about it. Don't do it. Do not do it. If you know um, your friend is asking for makeup and, you know, their parents don't allow them to wear makeup, why would you buy them makeup? It, like, it goes with, like, discretion and thinking about it. That's what I got from that part. But, yeah, I think everything should be done in moderation. That's the word I'm looking for. Everything should be done in moderation and everything that you're giving somebody should be, there should be thought put into it. Yeah, let's 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 dissect these these verses for a moment. Um. Well, I want to look at the last one, last but not least, definitely not the least. I think it basically summarizes everything. If ye then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. So, I understand Kezia's example, like giving them a PS4 or. Or you get what I mean. It's if it's not in the best benefit or the best interest of your child, there's no point in doing it. It's giving good gifts unto your children. This it's it also I think this has a spiritual meaning as well. Um because God is open, says asking it shall be given to you, seeking you shall find knocking the door will be. God is willing to help you. And as we say, if it's God's will, I mean, oh, God's will is the best way. So I basically, I think that's what these verses mean. 
it has like a literal and a spiritual meaning. Um, you can go, Kezia. Yeah, so I wanted to add to what you were saying about very basically the spiritual view from it. Um, God is not going, and like you were saying with God's will, God is not going to give you something if he knows you doesn't need you don't need it, especially that last part with giving good gifts to your children. And God knows our best. He has our best interest at heart. And he's not going to give us something or allow us to do something that he knows that will probably damage us or probably put our life on a completely different track. Um, God is not a micromanager. He's not a puppeteer. But he is, I believe, he will um, put things in your way that will deter you from making certain decisions. And I think he even speaks to you and lets you know, hey, like this is not it. But um, yeah, I think he, God really, um, he has our best interest at heart and he's not going to allow us to have something if he knows it's going to completely damage us. Okay. I think we copied a lot of points in this lesson. This lesson has a both literal and a spiritual meaning to it as well. Um... Now I'm going to hand over to Kezia because that's the end of me. I'm done. All right. Thank you, Joshua, for the questions. I liked them. I enjoyed answering them, and I'm sure Nathaniel did as well. All right, draw pointers. It is the end of the discussion, and that's unfortunate, but do not worry. We have a lot more coming up next. We have to Cal's Tasty Treats. And we are now in a completely new month. So it's February, yes. Um, so um, she will most likely be featuring a different country for this month. So we're very excited for that. And also we have Pastor DJ with our 28 grades and lesson recap. He does it so well, so flawlessly. And we also would like to say thank you to Uncle PJ for our PowerPoint recap every single week. He does an amazing job every single time. And yeah, that is all. But also we're asking you guys to please subscribe to the channel. Also visit kidsclubproduce.org and to also follow us on our Instagram account. Same handle at PowerPoint Savage School. I'll put it right down there. So please check out our Instagram account. And you know, it is February, a new month, but we hit 1K finally for our subscribe account. I am so grateful. We actually hit 1,011 subscribers. So we'd like to say thank you guys so, so, so much we're so grateful honestly um don't know what to say but thank you and we're so grateful for you guys hanging on and holding tight with us for such a, a long time it's almost been three years um this august will make three years of us doing this program but thank you so much guys thank you for sharing thank you for liking and thank you for subscribing to the channel and we love you guys so much so so much um unfortunately marcy is not with us she is out there celebrating her birthday so we're gonna wish marcia a happy happy birthday and happy birthday to the february babies we love you guys so much and happy birthday in advance um that is all but before we go can nathaniel please pray for us Dear God, thank you for bringing us all here again. Thank you for bringing Joshua, Kadia, and everyone else here. How that we brought into one today. Thank you for letting us hit 100K. We do this meeting many more times and help people. Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. We hit 1K. Let's go. Amen. Thank you, Nathaniel, for that exciting prayer. Um, That is all, PowerPointers. We love you guys so very much. And thank you for 1K. We love you guys. 
and we will see you all next week bye bye the church means the called at one this is pastor dj with what we believe for number two, I believe number 12 speaks of the church we believe as seventh day adventists that the church which is you and me we are the called at one call out of the the world of sin to join the community of believers to join those who confess with their mouth that jesus christ is the lord we also believe uh, that the church is the body of christ where christ is the head of the body we believe as well that the church is the bride of christ and so jesus is coming very soon to take his bride and to go to heaven and so today let us remember that we are special to god for he has called us to be a special people to him and so let us remember to share this good news to others first may god bless you and happy sabbath flowers have you ever heard of the ginger flower I just did and I just discovered that it is an awesome character teacher number one stay in the light ginger flowers thrive in the light do you seek the light of God do you know that you will thrive if you stay close to him stay close to Jesus who is the light number two stay nourished ginger flowers get nourished from moist organic well-drained soil with a slightly acidic ph as humans our spiritual nourishment comes from god's word stay nourished study god's word so you can grow spiritually number three your environment matters Ginger flower plants need high humidity and moisture. This is important for their growth. In the same way, we need the right environment if we are to grow in the way we should. Cool, isn't it? Ginger flowers are amazing character teachers.